so we're going to have a lot of fun with this, and we're going to probably share some stuff that you may know, but there's going to be a few things you may not know. I'm first going to do just a bit to the roundtable introduction, um, and I don't know if we need to start anywhere in particular, but maybe I'll just start with this gentleman right beside me, Tyler. We've got Nicola and we've got Steve. So they're our panel. Um, Tyler's from Sun Life, and uh, Nicola's from Homewood Solutions, the EAP program. And Steve is with a drug card provider called Express Scripts. So I'm not going to say much more. I'm going to let them do their one minute uh, introduction. And with that, I want them to, as well, talk about their one pet peeve and one thing on their bucket list. Uh, so Tyler Berg, I'm the uh, Director of Business Development for Sun Lake. So I lead our sales and service teams for Calgary National Accounts in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Uh, my passion, is particularly in group benefits, is pharmaceutical management and, and drugs, so Steve and I will get along well on that. My father and grandfather are both uh, pharmacists, so it's kind of been in, in the family that way. Um, my, my wife and I are expecting in, in five weeks, so if you see me check my phone and run out of the room, it was either because the question was too difficult or, um, <laughs> or i gotta get to the or i got to get to the airport just to uh, throw that out there. Uh, bucket list, I'm an avid golfer, so at some point in my life I'd like to make it down to Augusta and see the Masters uh, golf tournament. And pet peeve, I would say, is uh, texting while walking, and I must admit I'm guilty of doing my own pet peeve. So <laughs> yeah, so. Nicola. Uh, hi, I'm Nicola Mooney. I'm from Homewood Health, and uh, I thank you for inviting me to participate today. Um, I work with uh, several of you um, as we provide your employee and family assistance program. Uh, happy to introduce myself and come see me. Oops, I'm already a spilly talker. <laughs> <laughs> She's been uh, drinking already. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I'm an account executive. I work out of the Calgary office and I manage uh, Alberta-based clients as well as some in here in Saskatchewan. So I'm always happy to come out here. Um, my passion is in mental health and uh, reducing the stigma, uh, helping us talk a little bit more about mental health and mental illness and the impact of mental illness in the workplace. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, especially as it impacts uh, drug claims and, and disability claims. Um, I have a master's degree in organizational psychology and uh, I'm just about a professional psychologist in, in Alberta, so I'm pretty excited about that. That's kind of been on my bucket list. Um, but sort of socially speaking, I'd like to get to uh, uh, Boston and Chicago to see uh, MLB games with my husband. My pet peeve is when people leave their shopping cart in the middle of the aisle. Drives me nuts. Especially at Costco. And uh, yeah, that's about it. I have three kids, Maggie, Max, and Lila, seven, nine, and six. No particular order there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> one plays hockey, and the other two girls are into curling. So that one of my daughter's goals is to be in the Olympics. So you might see a Mooney, Team Mooney, Team Alberta, down the road. That's me. Steve. You told me this was a debate. <laughs> <laughs> you like surprises. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Are you yeah. going to be Trump? <laughs> you know, here I am on a panel. We have someone expecting. <laughs> somebody with young children. I'll start with, uh, I have one child, she's 24 years old. Uh, she is completing her legal studies in, in California right now. Good news is, two years ago she got a scholarship. <laughs> and where it came from, I don't know, it's an academic scholarship. Um, the, uh, so I'm the director of sales and marketing with Express Scripts Canada. Um, for those that don't know who Express Scripts Canada is, uh, we work behind the scenes in making drug cards work. So there's a very, very good chance, there's an 80% chance that that drug card is, is being made work by either TELUS or Express Scripts. Um, we've been doing that for 20 years in Canada. Um, through that time, we saw a lot of things happening in the Canadian drug spend. Five years ago, we made a decision to start introducing new services to the Canadian market to help members make better decisions. And we'll talk, I'm sure, about that a little bit more today. Um, I have over 30 years of experience uh, in sales and marketing. Um, grew up in Montreal, uh, lived 12 years in the US, four years in Europe, before coming back to Canada just about 11 years ago. As I came back to Canada, my entire career has been devoted to healthcare, the healthcare side of things. Uh, spending time with the Canadian Diabetes Association, a private health organization called Medicis, and now four years with Express Scripts. Um, pet peeve, oh, uh, bucket list. My bucket, so I'm, Polish ancestry. I lived in Europe for four years. I went and checked out. 
my ancestry. So on my bucket list is to truly go back and figure out where I even came from. Um, pet peeve, obviously I do a lot of traveling, reclining seats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's pet peeve. So. <laughs> awesome. All right. Okay. So let's roll into it. We're going to work with about five conversations, and we're, it's going to be a little bit interrelated. Um, some might not be exactly pertaining to the individual, but I'll bet you through the discussion something's going to pop out. So the first thing we're going to talk about, Nicola, you might say, oh, that doesn't pertain to me, but I do see an integration mm -hmm. in terms of how that will, uh, your business uh, and what you guys deal with is going to impact the number one thing on people's mind. Uh, yes, we have rising uh, benefit costs, but in particular, we have a, a huge um, jump uh, in escalating drug costs. And it's creating a major amount of concerns because we see it in our business when we start to break out uh, what used to be so simple as just a drug, then it became a brand and a generic, and then it became a brand and a generic and a biologic, and now we're gonna throw in biosimilars, and the list keeps growing, and so um, it is causing a lot of concern. So um, we're going to talk about what you've seen in the last 10 years um, with respect to the rising drug costs. And whether you see this, uh, what we're doing is fantastic, but do we see it as a necessary evil? Um, or are we going to see it get better before it gets worse? Because if we talk about some of the drug costs, and I know I had the opportunity to meet with uh, uh, to go to Tyler at the Sun Life um, Conference and um, some alarming stats came out of that. So we talk about biologic drugs and I know to my audience I've always said, oh, well, let's talk about, you know, Hep C. Um, and it could be upwards of $268,000 to treat it, which is an awesome thing. But let's consider a drug that it's used on a maintenance level um, to treat um, children that have um, issues with um, enzymes that don't allow for proper bone growth. Uh, and now we're starting getting into the millions. And it's, it's out there, and every day we turn around, we get a new one. I mean, I've got one on here, and it's 2.5 million. Like, what are we gonna do with this stuff? Yeah, so I'd say, uh, on that style, we talked about it in Sun Life to give a picture. So last year, on uh, 30 claimants in our block of business, we paid $19 million in drug claims for 30 people, and it goes to some of that. So. Um, so there's kind of an un unmistakable trend out there in the market uh, that there's more and more high cost specialty drugs, but they're doing amazing things. Um, there's kind of an emerging trend where we're seeing more of these specialty drugs focused on kind of what we'd call chron more chronic conditions. So you think of cholesterol and uh, asthma. So uh, conditions that we you know traditionally can treat for less, literally less than a dollar a day. Um, now we're seeing therapies for certain aspects of those that are $10,000, $25,000 a, a year. So, you know, it's not impacting 20 people in the Canadian Populations Act, potentially impacting 30% of the Canadian population, and how are we, we going to manage that? And then also, you know, I think long-term people are living longer, um, amazing changes in, you know, cancer survival rates and stuff like that. Uh, probably add on to this, but a big thing we're watching now is, you know, for the next three to five years is, is can developments in cancer medication. So, um, again, the change from, you know, 80s, 90s, we had these types of, I can just yell if that. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Or I can do this. Shut that off so we don't get feedback. Like nails on a chalkboard there, so yeah. um, that's a pet. A <laughs> uh, that's my list. But uh, so in terms of cancer medication, 80s, 90s, you always had your cancer treatments. You'd go to a hospital, and, and that's be where you get it. Uh, the one, you know, probably more than half of the ones coming out are now oral cancer medications. So you get them filled, and you go take them at home. And what that means for sponsors is that that no longer sits in the hospital budget. That's part of your group benefits plan on. And how do we, how do we manage all of that? Yeah, uh, I think to to. Everything, I, we agree with everything Tyler said, obviously, and just to add to it, it really isn't anything new. I think it's the numbers that are new. When we look at the drug trend over the last 20 years, this is a fact, this is Canadian spend on the private payer side. Every 10 years, it's doubled. And it, the trend is continuing, the same. So it's not a question of it being anything new to the market. Now it's just a question of the sustainability. How can we even afford to do this anymore? You know, when, when we were talking about a dollar a day treatment, yeah, okay, that's doable. But now when you're getting into the hundreds of thousand dollars a year per patient, 
the, the risk and the exposure. You know, some plans, all it's going to take is one patient, gone. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, when we take a look at drug spend, and we pay a lot of attention to it, every year we process over 100 million drug claims just in Canada. And so we have a lot of data that we pay close attention to. Part of our obligation is also to not only show what's happening, but also prepare everyone for what's in the pipeline. So when we hear about some of these designer drugs, they are very important drugs for the right individual. The biggest concern is overprescribing. Um, doctor, having spent so many years in the U.S., believe me, we, we can be very proud of our Canadian healthcare system because our doctors do a great job at diagnosing. But because of that disconnect from the cost of the drug to the diagnosis, which is the way I think it should be, there's a fear of overprescribing. Over and that's what there's a lot of attention being paid around from, from the benefits industry is how do we prevent the overprescribing without putting the right individual at risk. At the end of the day, we all want the right thing for the patient, but make sure it's the right patient. Um, in that 20 years of data, in that drug spend, we've also identified a lot of waste. And when we talk about waste, what we're saying is where there's a dollar being spent, but there's no additional benefit to health outcomes. Another way of saying that is if that dollar was never spent, you'd have the exact same health outcome. And that's just a different way of having to engage with a member. Nobody knowingly wants to go and waste the money. It's about creating that awareness at the member level, which is a big challenge. We all know that. And before I add to that, or I just add here before I get to you, Nicola, uh, opiates. Yeah. I just saw this article. You probably the, okay. so. Uh, doctors are actually realizing, yes. I mean, quote unquote, we've been over-prescribing and we need to reset this. Yep. The challenge is to reset this in a way that actually um, is adequately treating pain. Yes. And you hear that. It's not, you know, people are worried about the stuff that they find on the street. Yep. Um, I think we have a bigger problem with the stuff that we can buy and how it's abused. Yep. And so that in itself is a challenge, that's well, for sure. And it, it, you know, so as a a carrier or as an adjudicator, much to Duncan's point, we can catch fraud. But w if it's a legitimate prescription being written and it's being overprescribed, that's really at a doctor level. And the awareness that the doctor community now has around it, and some of the provinces are much farther along than others, and some of the statements and, and uh, I'll call it policies they put in place, is a move in the right direction, without a doubt. Yeah. So. And I find that. Interesting, I'll give this back to you, Nicola, because I'm going, yes, mental health, that's a challenge in our world. Um, is, there, is it always supposed to be treated with a drug? Because that becomes part of our top mm -hmm. three issues when it comes to costs. And so maybe a bit to that, overprescribing, maybe a bit not to really going through the process. We talked a lot about coping skills, um, every level of mental health, and everybody's ability to be able to cope is very different. Mm -hmm. So. I guess that would be the challenge. When does this piece fit in? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a chicken and the egg kind of question. Um, I, could <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, mental illness is a huge cost to employers. It's uh, you know, probably over 50%. In the next five years, you're going to see your mental health claims be the number one reason for, um, for claims. Am I good? Hear me in the back? Just take this one off. Put this one we'll Is this share. one on? You guys share and we'll share. How's that? Okay. Family now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is that better? Okay. Um, and and claims are claims are uh, rising in, in what we're seeing in the mental health side as well. I read a stat the other day that uh, fifty billion dollars is spent in Canada for to treat mental health issues. Twenty, not even twenty years ago, nineteen ninety eight, that was seven point nine billion. So it's drastically and very quickly increasing. Does that mean that more people are dealing with mental illness? I don't know that that's true. I think that the stigma is being reduced so people are more willing to talk about it. People are more willing to get treatment for it. Um, people are willing to go to their doctors, but do their doctors understand that they don't necessarily need medication for it? So there's that conversation that needs to happen as well. Um, building resilience like you spoke about um, uh, and ways to cope. People cope very differently. And uh, so I think coaching people um, how to build resilience. Resilience is something that people have and something that you can learn to have. You don't either have it or you don't. Uh, you can very much uh, increase your resilience um, over time. 
so I think sort of all those pieces in the picture will come together. I'll talk a little bit more about it because I think your questions probably direct me so I don't just hog the mic the whole time. But uh, mental illness is very much uh, an increasing cost to you as an employer, uh, both through drugs, through uh, short-term disability claims, long-term disability claims. Uh, and there's things that we can do to prevent that. So. And it will actually lead into, and Tyler alluded to it a little bit, chronic illness, because the drugs become part of that top list and chronic illness is one of it. So you had mentioned that point. 59% have at least one chronic illness on a survey that was done by Sanofi. Like, that's a big amount. I mean, and that's a lot of bucks that goes into it. And I know that you both have stats in terms of just like, this is where a lot of our spending's done, but there's an increasing issue with, you know, the, the biologic side is that even though there's less of them being prescribed, those are coming at higher dollar amounts. So we got to talk about the chronic illness because that's the one that still continues to grow. Um, we can't ignore the fact that 70% uh, of the cost of drugs is for maintenance. And a lot of those things can be controlled. If we could just focus in and do the right thing. I mean, that's a personal, not a, a consulting perspective, but I think we could do a better job. So um, I guess, you know, we want to be able to look at what can we do. And a lot of people focus on older people. They think that we're the problem. No, I'm not the old problem. There's people older than me in here, aren't there? We're the problem. <laughs> we're the problem, as my son would say. We're the problem. We're not, actually. Um, another interesting stat is that 40% of the younger generation, 40% have a chronic condition. Like, that's just not right. So, so I guess with that, I guess, what can, what can we do? Like, I mean, chronic illness is leaving its mark. What do you think we could be doing differently from your perspective and your roles? So, um, so chronic conditions are, um, I think mine is working on right now. Okay. Well, you're the uh, lucky one. <laughs> <laughs> um, chronic conditions um, are often not understood. So as a patient, oftentimes they forget that they have a chronic condition. And, and the reason for that is whether they take their meds or they don't take their meds from one day to the next, they feel the same. So. Because it's a chronic condition, adherence is critical. And because somebody feels the same from one day to the next or the day after without taking their meds, they forget they have a chronic condition and don't realize what's really happening inside their body. And you know, the reason it's a chronic condition is left unmanaged, it is going to create complications, other complications. What does that mean to a plan? It means stronger doses, more expensive drugs, or more drugs because other conditions have set in. Um, you know, if we take a look at the progression of a, uh, a non-adherent patient, we know for a fact that two years down the road, there is going to be a second drug introduced and a second condition. And when we follow that patient, we can see them all of a sudden ending up with four and five conditions being treated. And it all comes from adherence. So yes, most of us develop a chronic condition at a younger age. And if it's managed properly and there's programs in place to help somebody understand the importance of adherence, you're going to be able to offset the down, the down road costs that are going to come with that patient. Let's not talk about the patient's own lifestyle. You know, it, it's going to help them as well. It's just, again, that awareness at that, uh, that patient level that's critical. So adherence is one of the most important things to deal with a chronic condition because it's there. It's not going to go away. It just has to be managed now. Um, yeah, so I think there like a couple of things like the having chronic illnesses and managing them there in your workforce is not something you can avoid. So there's kind of the how do we support employees that are going to have them? We have an aging workforce in Canada with aging, you get more chronic illnesses. There's no way to kind of avoid that. And then there's a bigger focus we need to put on the front end of things because like Deb alluded to, um, you look at, uh, you know, stats now that, like in Canadian youth, a third of them are you know, or overweight and obese, you know, as you look at, at how, how we rank that and what that means for diabetes and chronic conditions coming into the workforce. Mental health is a, is a huge one, you know, lots of research on uh, Nicola can, uh, you know, add to in terms of, again, the younger generation just being less resilient on some of these than, than our parents and, and grandparents sort of stuff. So, so there's the preventative aspect we need to, to focus on of, in, and, and employers form part of this in terms of how we keep those people that are healthy, healthy or at risk, maybe move them from 
from being at risk too healthy, but also, you know, in terms of Steve's point, there are going to be people who are off with chronic illness and how do we help them manage that and support them uh, adherence and those sorts of things. Yeah, you bring up mental health and 20% of our youth right now are dealing with a mental illness. Again, is it just because they feel more comfortable talking about it or are they struggling with mental illness? And mental illness can definitely become a chronic disease. Um, depression, anxiety, these can all be chronic um, uh, issues that people struggle with. They don't need to be. They don't necessarily need to be medicated through, through drugs. Uh, there are definitely times when they can and ought to be, but they don't necessarily have to be. So I think um, building resilience for our youth is uh, needs to be um, first and foremost for, for our children, for our little kids. You know, I talked to my daughter the other day. She was, she was anxious about a test. She didn't use the words anxious, but I could tell that she was experiencing anxiety. Actually, what she did say, she says, I'm so stressed about this. And I thought, how are you stressed? You're nine. But I think if she, well, I talked to her about it because uh, one, of the, one of the approaches to building resilience is to um, use, use your words. You know, when we say to our toddlers, use your words, um, we need to do that as adults. Like, what? What am I feeling right now? What, can, what word can I apply to this emotion that I'm feeling? I'm feeling stressed. I'm feeling anxious. Why is it? And um, really bring yourself into the situation, a form of mindfulness, where you are present in a situation uh, to help you um, acknowledge what you're feeling at this moment. These are all things that we can do to, to build our resilience. I have a little bit of a mindfulness uh, uh, activity that I'll do near the end maybe but because um, I think that mindfulness is really important to building resilience and another good article that uh, they had passed around was um, for those who have the EAP program through Homewood um, Health is building a self-care plan and he goes oh my god that sounds so tough but it's not it's really not t I think that we and it'll lead into our next question but I think at the end of the day um, yes to your point mental illness is one of the top three I mean it's high blood pressure high cholesterol and mental illness. That's your top three when it comes to chronic illness. So what could we be doing differently, you know, in, in terms of managing that? And, you know, self-care is, is really self-management. And I mean, yes, the employer is there to, you know, play a role in that. And, you know, we have a responsibility because we have, we have a business to run. So we want to make sure you're healthy so that we can get back, you back to work and we're all healthy and happy and getting along and doing kumbayas and all that stuff. But the same token, I can't help you if there's something going on on the other end of the world that we can't deal with. I only see, or the employees or your colleagues only see what's going on there. And so, you know, two things always come to mind is that are we trying to do enough to self-manage that? Um, am I too reliant on the healthcare system to say, just pop me a drug and I'll feel just fine? Um, because I feel like that's a little bit to the Band-Aid solution. Again, that's the personal, because it, I mean, we're, we just, we're seeing this. And, and there's like a, a gray area where there's the real need depression care. There's a real need for depression care. But then there's that other part saying, can we be better at self-managing and taking care of ourselves so that we're not going down those roads? So so I guess in the leading into the question three, um, do you think happier, happier employees make healthier employees? Tyler. Um, so fundamentally, uh, yes. And, and you know, in our, as we're looking at products and stuff, we tend to flip that around and look at do healthier employees make happier employees? And, you know, all the research would point to yes. And so for uh, organizations, um, as you know, and again, four to five employees would tell you my employer has a responsibility to help support me in, in my health. Now, it's not totally the employer's responsibility, but what role do you do you fit in and kind of kind of filling that uh, in that? role for them because you know again as you look at you know healthier you know we've all either personally or, or in our co-workers when somebody's going through a health event or or an illness um, it is harder for them to be productive engaged and because they're focused on on other other items naturally and so again the more we can improve that engagement the better it is for organizational health and a lot of that goes back to how do we keep our employees healthy and again ties into the you know the topics we've been talking about, so the keeping people healthy, those with chronic illnesses, supporting them through the workplace, and, and again, that organizational health score being as, as high as we can leads to better organizational outcomes. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think, uh, when you asked that question though, I thought, oh, I don't know, I don't know if I totally agree with this, that a happy employee, a happy person is a healthy person. Is that yeah. the question, right? Yep. Yeah, because I, I, I <laughs> uh, however, um, 
I do agree that um, happier individuals tend to take better uh, precautions towards their health. They tend to um, engage in healthy activities, um, eating better, um, being outside, exercising, um, just taking better care of their overall health. Um, however, I wouldn't say the, that, like I personally myself feel like I'm quite happy and content um, but I can definitely do a lot more to my overall health. So I was kind of putting it into my own perspective. Yeah. But I think there, the research does show that there is, a, uh, there is a very strong connection between those who are happy and those who are healthy. And um, that uh, if you can uh, do things to find yourself to be happy, that you are more likely to make healthier decisions. When you're, when you're sad, if you take the opposite, when you're sad or depressed, you're not like, likely to make healthy decisions. So. Um, in, in that contrast, I would say that yes, happy individuals tend to be healthier individuals. And, and, and maybe too on that point, because it is, I think one thing that gets missed a lot is that because we don't know, we don't know the happy part, we don't know the healthy part, we just see the person for the person, you know, whether it's your colleague, whether it's your child, whether it's your employer, but um, maybe one thing we're missing in all this is just, you know, like, I mean, being a bit more vulnerable and just saying, you know, I kind of had a had a crappy day yesterday and maybe I'm not gonna be at my best today but instead of everybody going oh my god what's wrong with Jane you know like I mean and and things get taken out of context and so then when you open up those conversations not that you got to get into the details but maybe it allows a little bit more for some um, some support right and 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 understanding and that would probably take away from the stress levels and people's perceptions and so in turn would make it a much happier healthier workplace um, I guess just, it's, it is a difficult question to answer, but I think it's an easier question to put into context when you think of, does unhappiness contribute to a healthier uh, workplace? Or Well, clearly no. So when you look at it that way, what contributes to unhappiness? It's fear and uncertainty. If you look at anyone that is unhappy, it's being driven at its root cause. It might be fear and uncertainty that's leading to mental health issues. It might be fear and uncertainty around uh, a diagnosis they've got when we're talking about their pure health. Emotionally, it might be fear and uncertainty in their relationship or in something their children are up to. So the more that we can address where that fear and uncertainty is coming from, it's gonna lead to happiness, which the byproduct should be a healthier workplace. I, I think the two do go hand in hand. So I'm going to just throw just one in there before we get to the next question, because uh, we, we talk a lot about it a little bit, but um, it goes back to when we get through this subject, it's wellness, like it's those wellness initiatives. So if you could just think about, you know, if, if you could develop something, because a lot of our clients are going like, what am, how am I going to do this, Deb? Like if we're playing a part in this, what am I, how am I going to do this? We're like a 25 man company. Um, you know what? We got projects going all through the summer. How am I going to be there for those people? We have a part to play, and so you know, you'd like to say, you know, John, figure it out. But, but what we could do, so if we could kind of just, you know, like I mean, we've done a few things. We've done the Wellness Partners Program. We've introduced our discounted gym memberships. I mean, those are very common things. But um, is there things that you can think of? Maybe more, this is more on a personal level, maybe not professional level. That you said, if you could come to a company, say, what could we do to be better, to connect this bunch and make us, uh, you know, much more healthier. <coughs> Uh, so one example, personally, I know it, like at our company, it's just, um, you know, it's, it's an idea that, um, you know, a big issue in Canada today is like, you know, lots of people don't have a family doctor. And so if you ask, you know, folks, your, you know, what's your cholesterol level? What's your blood gluco glucose level? When's the last time you checked on that? They'd have no, no idea. And so uh, one thing that you can access and available to, you know, you know, there's lots of great companies out there. It's like kind of biometric screening. So I know, once you're at our company, we do a screening clinic, 10, 15 minutes worth of nurse. You go in, takes all that. You get your cholesterol, blood glucose, kind of body mass, kind of your core stuff that, you know, as a 36-year-old male, I can say I'm not doing that every year with my, my doctor like I should be. Um, and so so it just kind of gives me that info. And, and we always hear like when, when you go through these with, with employees, there's always that one person typically in there who gets a result and goes, holy cow, like my blood pressure is off the charts. You should go to your hospital or, or that sort of stuff. So that's a personal example that I, we just did one, you know, ours last week and, and the type of stuff that's available because of the lack of um, you know, kind of physician contact that the first thing in taking action is you need to be aware. And if I don't even know I have a problem, how do I, I action that? So, that's a good example. 
like that. <laughs> um, uh, something that we offer at Homewood is a health risk assessment that made me think of uh, what uh, Tyler was speaking about. And I think, um, like he says, what you, you don't know what you don't know, and you can't help what you don't know. So uh, get to know yourself, do the biometrics, do the health risk assessment, get a picture of what your current health is looking like. And uh, no good health risk assessment won't provide a direction as to what you can do, uh, target areas for um, where your sleep habits are, or your alcohol um, habits, or your, the way you deal with stress, or what your cholesterol looks like and where to go. So I think um, having a good excuse me, a good picture of what your current health looks like is, is one of the first steps. From an organizational standpoint though, I think that, and bringing it back to the mental health side too, is that we need to reduce that stigma um, to help people see uh, the signs and symptoms of what mental illness looks like. 25% um, of us, so a quarter of us in this room this year will experience a mental, he mental health challenge. That doesn't mean that we're all going to be um, you know, bipolar or schizophrenic. It means that we're going to deal with some anxiety or some stress or some depression or some grief. We don't know if a loved one's going to die tomorrow um, and we'll deal with some grief from that. So uh, understanding what prolonged grief looks like um, when depression becomes more than just a sad mood um, I think that that's really important. And then for, for HR professionals, for your managers, your supervisors, your people leaders, um, uh, help them, educate them, uh, give them the resources that they need, either whether it's through Homewood. If you're, worth, if you're with Homewood, talk to me. We can do some people leader training to help people leaders know what to look for in their employees and then what to do with that. Um, educate them through uh, Mental Health Commission of Canada. Uh, there's lots of resources out there online that you can provide to your people leaders to help them uh, see the signs and symptoms in their employees. Another one to do is to talk about it. Make it part of your discussions. I was telling, uh, uh, um, sorry, I forget your name, <laughs> cheating at our table. Uh, we were talking uh, uh, over the break and uh, I have yet to be at an uh, oil and gas company for a meeting where we don't have a safety minute and it's always physical safety. Uh, but what about mental safety? So have a little moment in your, in your staff meetings, uh, your monthly um, round tables. Uh, make it part of the discussion where you just have a mental health moment. Um, and it can be, maybe it's uh, coming up to the stress of Christmas time or making sure that you, if you're with Homewood, of course, make sure you hand out your, um, your monthly newsletter to make sure that there's an awareness that you can talk about there. So, um, and then finally, support your people leaders. Support them, give them the resources that they need and make sure that they know who they can talk to when there is uh, some identification of mental illness in your workplace. Because uh, I would um, pretty much bet a million bucks that 99% of the people leaders out there haven't been trained to be clinicians. So don't put them in that position. Uh, let them do their job best and uh, give it to yourself and the professionals to deal with it. Um, I, so where do I go? Uh, so, um, so obviously what I'm currently doing in my profession doesn't lend very much to wellness initiatives, but I can tell you in my career, having been uh, involved in it, the unfortunate thing is the 15% of the people that don't need it are the ones that always or tend to take part in most of the wellness initiatives that are done. And when we've looked at those organizations, why is that? It really becomes a culture of the organization. And unless an organization is really prepared to introduce wellness as part of its culture, and when I say that I mean from the very top down, you're going to end up with the same 15 to 20 percent. It, it's unfortunate, but it really is a strategy that an organization has to take on. If wellness really is something, it can't be just something on a to-do list, part of the benefit offering. It has to be a strategy that the corporation has said, this is important to us. And even just, you know, again, I know these sound like big projects, and, and, but you can do very, very simple things, and if you can't get it at the corporate level, um, you know, something so simple, and my daughter just laughed me off, but I did tell her it does work, and she probably does it, and I don't know it, because I told her if you do it, you won't, I won't know. And she was very stressed about going into um, uh, a soccer game, and so it's her first game, you know, it's like the Huskies, and like this is stress, and the last thing you want to do is jump on that field and you're stressed, because the one first mistake you make, then you're just, you're going to probably be so mad at yourself. I said, you know what, we're driving along, and I said, you know what, do something really simple. I said, just sit there. You know, put the music on, don't talk to me. Take 10 deep breaths. Okay, take four deep breaths. Just take a breath and hold it and just sit there and then let it out. And then take another breath. 
and hold it and let it out. I said, you'd be amazed how much better you feel when you do that. And I know when I started doing that was when I started getting into public speaking because I'd be, for lack of better shit, in my pants. And I just, <laughs> because like everybody, it's hard to do. It's very hard to do. So Toastmasters and Colton's in Toastmasters, so you can attest to some of the things that they do um, to make you feel really good, but to take stress off. So if it can work with public speaking, it can work with every, you're going into a big presentation, you need to deal with a difficult situation in the family household. So, um, you know what, there's simple things you could do to create wellness. And, and another one that we used to talk about was the worry file, because everybody worries, we all worry. So, you know, you're supposed to take a file and you throw something in there and don't think about it. You only get one day a week to talk about the stuff that worries you. And by the time you get to the file, chances are 70, 80% of them are already solved and went away. And they probably weren't even an issue. You just got out of bed after having a really bad sleep, and today it was an issue, right? You talk about mental, like, I mean, our way of thinking. Your, your brain only holds one thought. It's a good thought or a bad thought. And if we continually think the negative thoughts, um, it's going to be a bad day, right? So, so simple things, and I think that's important. And to the children and the, the millennials, I think that worries me that we're dealing with anxiety and stress at a younger age. So, so we need to work on that, that's for sure. So. So we talk about that. I mean, when you talk about these programs and the things that we can do, um, it's not a one-size-fits-all um, because we do have two major components coming into the workplace, and that's the millennials, and that's um, dealing with cultural diversity. And so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big one on the agendas because even when it comes down to communication, how do you deal with someone who's got very limited um, uh, speaking ability, English speaking ability? How do you deal with someone who came from a world that they don't even believe in group plans. They didn't even know what that word meant and who, who gets insurance, right? So it's gonna be interesting how we're gonna deal with that. So in your, what you're seeing, Tyler, like, I mean, people get challenged by, you know, how do we make this group benefit plan work for everybody? Or can we, can we? Um, so it's when you look, so, you know, there's millennials and now we're actually have Gen, Gen Z, I think they're called. So they're actually uh, millennials, you know, Gen Z is entering the workforce now. So it's, it is a challenge for organizations because you'll have managers um, who are managing four different generations and how you deal with those generations has to be different. Um, we did a bunch of survey work and so essentially there actually is some commonality throughout the, the generations when you talk about group benefits plans where, uh, you know, in our research, it's if you ask them, you know, what's the most, what's the number one thing I could do to improve my group benefits plan, um, the number one item for actually all four cohorts is more flexibility. So even the baby boomers would would say that. So that that's an interesting thing when we, when we look at designs and stuff like that, that there actually is some commonality. Now there are some differences too. So when we look at technology and willingness to use technology and those sorts of things, not surprisingly, the millennials and Gen Z um, group would rate much higher on on that sort of stuff than than um, Gen X and, and, and the boomers. Um, and the cultural one's interesting, like Canada is the highest proportion of uh, visible minorities in G8 countries. So, you know, StatsCan's projecting in 15 years, it'll be like one in three Canadians will be a, a visible minority. And so it's an interesting thing as we look at group benefits plan and, you know, some other cultures and therapies that are common in those other cultures that may not be ingrained in Canada. Can, can we introduce those in, the, in our plans? And so we're seeing, you know, some creative stuff in terms of taxable wellness accounts and that sort of thing that can cover some of these types of expenses that, uh, you know, an ordinary group benefits plan based on our current tax rules couldn't. So, so you can get creative in, in, in doing uh, this sort of stuff. So, so there's, you know, so they're not, there are, the thing I would say is they're, it's, they're not totally different in all aspects of a group plan, benefits plan is they do have some common commonalities amongst the groups. Uh, I would agree with that, Tyler, um, uh, that uh, there is some commonality amongst groups of people. However, what we're finding is in the EAP industry is that uh, different cultures definitely um, uh, treat um, counseling and work-life balance very differently. So uh, oftentimes minorities don't uh, talk about their issues. They don't want to talk about it. That's just something you don't do. In North America, it's becoming uh, more likely that you, uh, or, or traditional North Americans, um, that you that it's okay to talk about your issues. It's okay to see a counselor. In other cultures, that's uh, something that they're moving beyond. Um, however, having said that, uh, I was at a health fair a couple of months ago for a, an organization where minorities are the majority and, um, and heavily male populated as well came to me and and, see, and I and I had promoted a lot of our online e-courses uh, specifically around anger management because 
it seemed like every second person that came by, the individual would say, you know, do you have anything to deal with anger and frustration? And I thought, huh, that's an interesting trend that I saw right there is that um, different cultures, different genders, different ages of people um, come to us for very differing reasons. And so if you take a look at your workforce and if it's very diverse, uh, do a little research uh, on, on the types of issues that that population typically experiences because uh, it's, it's not one size fit all. Um, but um, there is some options when it comes to group plans, when it comes to EFAP programs um, uh, that you can you can help your people uh, put together a plan that's more customized to them yeah I, I, you know I think everything's been uh, addressed I think the only thing that I'd add to it is um, cultural differences aren't just based on uh, demographics from uh, someone's country of origin like for if if we take a look at a, um, the cultural differences just from the US population to the Canadian we look the same but our outlook on group benefits is so different. Um, there's a much keener understanding in the U.S. from an employee because they're much closer tied to what's being paid, why it's being paid, and the whole concept of stop loss that ever, that's new to us here in Canada, and I know we're going to talk about that in a second. In the U.S., every individual is made aware of it very early because they're told they have a lifetime limit. That's a de facto stop loss. So, you know, it, it's the cultural issue that we're talking about is really, I think the Canadian uh, culture is adapting itself based on sustainability and the needs of our uh, changing population. So I think it goes, uh, it's definitely beyond just someone's country of origin. Right? Well, and on that note, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the, uh, the question, maybe you can add to it. Um, because you talk about, you know, like, the drugs and and I mean that's your role, right? Mm -hmm. I mean you guys are about developing drugs and great drugs and and, but I also see from when we're dealing with this cultural diversity, um, and you're right, this perceptions is that because for me, I'm from Canada, yeah. but I have a perception that I would love to see more alternative, mm -hmm. like benefits on my benefit plan. So I would choose not to go down the road of getting a drug that's got a DIN number. And I get that asked a lot because they're going, oh, you know, like, I mean, I mean, we're doing a little bit, we're getting there. Like we're, you know, acupuncture and naturopath and, but it's, it's the DIN side. So I can send someone, one of our wellness partners is, is more on the alternative side. So through the spending account, we can write off his consulting fees, but the, the, what they provide in the terms of, um, you know, prescribing um, solutions is not. So people have to pay out of their pocket. So why is it people don't go more often to an alternative practitioner? Because they got to dig into their genes, mm -hmm. which is it's unfortunate because I think it would help alleviate our rising costs if we could, let's talk about medical marijuana. <laughs> I mean, there is things out there that are being a little bit more controversial and people are wanting to test them, but it's such gray waters. I mean, I guess, Steve, it, why is it we, or can we, or are we moving more to trying to be a bit more open-minded on the drug side? So I, I, th I think at the end of the day, um, when we talk about the drug side, let's face it, we operate in an environment that has legislation, and legislation is Health Canada. So everyone has to operate within Health Canada regulations. So that's the starting point. So if Health Canada aren't going to recognize something as a drug, nobody else can. So unfortunately, um, you know, we're talking about an issue that goes far beyond, I think, uh, the carrier side of things, the adjudication side of things, even the prescribing side of things. It comes down to, part of what we talked about is this, the Canadian culture is Health Canada to determine. And then everything kind of falls off of that. I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying that's the way it is. So we need to lobby more. Well, maybe we need to, maybe we as the consumer, the end user, need to challenge the with, status quo. Without a doubt. And say, you know, I mean, is there a better way? Not to say there's one replacing the other, but you are seeing it on the traditional, you know, side and the medical side yeah. that there is those relationships they're building with yeah. those alternative practitioners. And you'll see quite often they will actually be practicing and integrating yeah. both. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a great start. With, without a doubt. Yeah, I think it's a great start. So, um, okay. So just watching our time. Okay. So. Um, How come you only ask me that question? There's yeah. other people here. Because you wanted a debate. <laughs> <laughs> Touche, okay. <laughs> Do you guys want to add to that, though? Uh, I think some of it's like a, 
So this is bad time management having Nicola and I on the stage. It's uh, we should have cut it to two questions. We probably could have filled the hour. But the uh, I think it's a philosophical thing for each benefit plan is different too. So is it you know we talk about you know two percent of our claimants are spending thirty percent of our benefits dollars nowadays on the drug side of things. So is is philosophically your benefits plan there as insurance? Um, and so we want to cover people if it for catastrophic stuff, which we tr traditionally consider insurance for, or is it there for as part of a recruitment retention and how I design my plan may be fundamentally different on those two because the issue everybody has to deal with is we don't have unlimited dollars to spend on the plans and so where you might put those dollars is going to depend on, on your philosophy. So. Yeah, I mean, I'll make the plug that you can definitely um, invest in your people um, on the mental health side that give them the strategies ahead of time so that the, the, those alternative forms yep. of, of uh, coping and resilience and dealing with situations so they don't get to the point where they uh, need to access the drugs. But nope. I agree. I agree. Um, okay, so last quick question because I know I was just watching and the girls haven't put the hook out on me yet. I'm amazed. But um, anyways, it's all four of us now. you got to drag down, just so you know. <laughs> Um, okay. Be that hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, only just because it, it is a big part of it, but it's it's kind of moving in another direction. But certainly, it's going to play a huge uh, part in terms of how we deal with all these things, and that's technology. Um, again, you know, we talk about those millennial millennials, and they're saying for the first time, they're going to know more than we know. And so these people are in our workplace, and we're still, for the most part, running the company. And now we've got these young sorry, Colton, punks, in there, and they're going like, well, what did they know, right? But they do, they know a lot, and I mean, there's just, and it, and it does create a lot of opportunity, so, in a lot of respects, so, I mean, I've got a couple ideas, but I mean, because you, you think about 20 years back, what, what we were all, in all our businesses, how technology played a part in our business, and, and what's it now? Like, I mean, that's, yeah. that's significant, and, yeah. and it's, it's increasing that much more every day, so, so maybe just to, to maybe just give a quick thought or a, a point in terms of where you see technology coming into play, not just with respect to, you know, like, I mean, the tools that we have, but even just how we operate as a business. Um, yeah, so on the technology side, I think it's, I mean, it's a challenge and an opportunity, I would say, too. And so part of it is, you know, work, your suppliers and stuff is, you don't have to do all of this yourself. And so it's discussion with your suppliers to make sure, like, what are you doing that, you know, in 2025, 75% of my employees are going to be Gen Z or millennials and they access stuff very differently than, than we do. So in our block, we're already seeing this. So for the first time last year, like usage of our website stayed pretty, pretty flat. And, but online services were still going like this. All of the growth was in mobile. And so by the end of next year, we're expecting 40% of our interactions with members in terms of benefits. So claims and accessing information will be through mo a mobile device, not through a website. And 15 years ago, it was the same discussion with paper to, to website. So that's just how quickly things are changing. So what are you doing to be prepared for, uh, for that? But it also brings about opportunities because um, you think about wellness and some of the challenges of engaging people. When you look at the younger demographics, they're much more willing to, you know, privacy is much less, less of an issue for them. We see the stuff kids post on Facebook and stuff like that. And so certain things, they're much more willing to, you know, share information and do some of that sort of stuff that that you you need to kind of collect some of this data and stuff. So there's also an opportunity there with some of the great apps and reward programs and stuff like that, that that generation is much more likely to be open to that, some that sort of stuff than, and, and again, I'm characterizing people in, in generations and it's not clean across, but, but there's opportunities there too, I think, in how we look at our, our programs. Yeah, and in the in the EFAB field, we're um, we're evolving to make uh, counseling more accessible through tablets and phones and e-counseling and texting and immediate chat, uh, which I think is is a benefit for that um, for those generations and those people that uh, do like to communicate through their devices. However, I, there's such a uh, negative aspect to uh, always having your head down, and we're not experiencing the world that we're in right now. And uh, when you think about mindfulness and being mindful, which is being present uh, and being in the moment, you can't do that when your head is 12 inches from your hand all the time. Um, so um, here, I'll do this mindfulness activity because I think this is a really good takeaway. This is something that I learned um, to help people who are dealing with anxiety. However, um, this is 
to me, it's applicable to somebody who just wants to be in the moment. And if you imagine uh, yourself uh, on a trip, you're on a, on, on a vacation, and you think, I just want to remember this. I don't want to forget this time. What do we do? We take pictures of everything, don't we? Because then we're going to look back at those pictures so that we can remember it. But you don't really. You don't, rarely do you go back to the picture, for one. You're at a concert. You see everybody's got their phone up. They're not in the moment. They're worried about looking, at the, looking through uh, the screen to be able to post it to Facebook to tell everybody that they were at the Adele concert. That's not being in the moment. So here, so um, something that I learned about being mindful is to use your senses. So uh, if you're in a situation or you're in a, in a room like this, find five things that you can see. Just look around the room. Look five things. So the lights on the ceiling, the tablecloths, different, five different things. Uh, the bow that that lady has in her hair. Whatever it is, five things. Think of four things that you can touch. So it might be the, the bounciness of the chair, might be the um, tablecloths, might be the fabric of your pants that you're wearing. So the five things that you can touch. Think of uh, three things that you can hear. Can you hear? There's a bit of feedback, there's an air conditioner. But it might be if you're on the beach, it might be the waves, it might be kids in the background playing, it might be uh, a, a conversation that you're just eavesdropping in on. <laughs> Um, think of two things that you can smell. Might be perfume of the person next to you. Might be um, uh, the, the waves, again, the ocean smell of the beach. Uh, think of two things that you can smell. And then think of one thing that you can taste. It might be still tasting that bacon from this morning. <laughs> or it might be uh, just something, yeah, just something that you, the last thing that you ate. But now you've involved all five of your senses and you've thought of, what's that, about 20 different things to make you be present in that moment. And not only does that help with anxiety, if that's something that you struggle with, remember those five things, but also if you don't struggle with anxiety, it helps you just remember the moment, which we don't do anymore. We capture the moment on our phones, but we don't remember them anymore. Well, we all had that moment where we drive home and we don't remember getting there. That's scary, isn't it? It's scary if you're doing that while you're looking at your phone, too, which don't ever do that. That was but, scary, yeah. that was scary. So the, the question, uh, just uh, technology, right? What we're doing, where, okay. Where we were 20 years, where we, where we are now, maybe yeah. where we're going. Like, how so, do you yeah, so uh, um, when we look at it from our world, remember our world has been processing drug claims. Uh, five years ago, we started a little bit more on the engagement side. So now, back 10 years ago, um, the technology was used all in the back room. It was all in the back room as to how that claim is adjudicated. Um, where it's evolved to now in our world is uh, we're able to take people, for example, that we know uh, that in our book of business, uh, when we look at the diabetes population, um, only 60% are adherent. That's a scary thought when you think of uh, what diabetes, what complications that arise from it. It happens quickly. Um, when we're able to work directly and engage with a member, uh, we're able to drive um, I guess I do have to use this, isn't it? Okay, um, we're, able to, we know that we're able to take that same population and drive it up to a 90% adherent. That's just through member engagement, but behind it all is technology that's giving us the visibility and the steps required to take with that individual. Where is it going? It's putting that in the hands of the member um, so that they can do it themselves. One of the challenges right now as to why the technology can already do that, it now is privacy legislation, um, interaction of claims data with pharmacy data, how are you allowed to use it, and when we talk about privacy legislation, it's not just privacy legislation, it's also something on our side of the world that's a big challenge, is every province has its own pharmacy legislation. So when you have inconsistencies from one province to the next, it makes it very difficult to bring out a robust solution that's gonna satisfy all, it becomes a watered down solution. I'll ask one question. Do you think fax machines are still sold today? Pure fax machines. The answer is yes. Guess who the biggest client of fax machines is? Pharmacies. So today, legislation still says, even though technology has evolved so far, that a pharmacy is not allowed to receive a scanned copy or even a fax copy from someone's home. It has to come directly from the doctor's office. Now, the challenge for a doctor is a doctor says, 
that's adding an extra step to my job that I don't have to do. So what do they do? They start charging for it. And when you look at it, it's all based on policies that were set up at one time that made a lot of sense because the safeguards weren't there. But a lot of work has been done within the industry uh, to address that. It's happening around the rest of the world, yet there are some roadblocks that somewhat prevent what we can really do with a patient in Canada. Um, so uh, from a technology standpoint, it's literally where we're going, is having everything at the fingertips of that person as they're diagnosed. So we can start engagement day one. Well, and you think too about some of the things that we're talking about, like the, what we're using, you know, like the app and the texting and the email. All, but genome mapping, like, mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's technology tools. I mean, my father is a classic example. He's done a, I don't know if anybody's done a colonoscopy, but apparently they're not fun. And um, when he did it 15 years ago, or tw he, he just, he did not enjoy the process at all. Well, now he's in for the second one and he's stressed. So not only like counseling his stress, because he's just like anxious, because um, he thinks he can go through the same process, but apparently they've changed everything. So it's much easier, much more relaxing, much more enjoyable, if you can imagine that. But but goes back to the technology has moved all these things in a different level. So if we can understand brain waves and understand where the brain's going, maybe the treatment plan on that is much better. Or, you know, how you treat diabetes, because now people can have that instant alert, you know, rather than going into, you know, a, a state of, of chronic, you know, issues, right? And so, I mean, there there's an it, it is another necessary, these won't come cheap. I mean, this is technology that's going to come at a premium. But in the same token, the on you know the, the outcome of that is that I mean, people will stay healthier, will be able to minimize or maybe eliminate some of the things that we're seeing in today's world. So um, I you know I think it's something that's I mean it's welcome and it's braced, but it, it's just we're not used to it. We're just not used to it, having not had any of this 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I mean, it's been there, but not at the level it's growing now. So. I think the greatest analogy is the banking industry. Someone talked about. The evolution of the banking industry earlier today and when you think of so i'm old enough to remember when the first debit card came at my doorstep and i remember the fear the stress i was used to lining up every thursday two o'clock bankers hours two o'clock in the afternoon with my bills in one hand my bank book in the other and my paycheck going and paying my bills and taking out money for the week and then next thursday doing it again think of where it's come to today i I do my banking when I want to. Banks are still there, but they serve a completely different purpose. And so healthcare is going to evolve that way. It has to. There's going to be a lot of friction because some of my population, we're used to doing it one certain way. And it's going to take a while for us to get there. But the same is going to happen in healthcare. It has to. My daughter, like, in in terms of Steve on the drug side, some amazing stuff in terms of to keep it on. There's a company in Ottawa, Ottawa now, Spartan DNA. Uh, you can Google it where they're saying literally they can do a full DNA mapping from um, you know sample to output in 30 minutes in a machine that fits in the palm of my hands or pharmacogenomics, pharmacogenetic testing. So personalized prescribing, you know, the old world, my physician would kind of try a prescription you know, go back in a week, see how it worked, and we'd adjust, and, you know, am I a fast metab metabolizer, slow metabolizer, all that sort of stuff. So there's testing and everything now that's developing where, you know, I can kind of pre-do some of these tests, so in theory could go to my physician and have a much better outcome, and so just amazing in terms of biotechnology and that sort of stuff as it comes to, to healthcare. Um, so again, lots of work to be done on who's paying for this, what are the regulations around it, but, but all this technology actually exists in the world today. Yeah. Oh, and I know that's probably one of the concerns that we all have is that this is all great, but who's gonna pay for it? And, and maybe we're paying for it, but the outcome at the end of the day is gonna be better and it's gonna be less. So we maybe have to go through a couple of humps until we get it better. So, so no, I, I think there's uh, the journeys, I, I believe just begun in a lot of these areas. So um, that's why we spend a lot of time trying to educate you, but no, we don't expect you to know everything. Um, but when we talk to you, it, it's for a reason. We want that open dialogue. We want you to understand the bigger picture stuff that's going on because um, it's not just about the rates. It's not just about, you know, like I know even Nicola, I get people that say, well, you know, we're paying for the EAP plan, but we're not using it. And then I, I want to drop it. But why would you want to? I mean, what you need to do is the thing you need to do is educate people and communicate it so that it's there so that it helps manage those other things. So 
that you will eliminate the person going on disability or having to take the medication. So um, it's a lot of it's a lot of dialogue. I think that's what we need to do is spend a lot of time and, and see bigger pictures. And that's why I wanted to pull this team together because I thought it was really important to see how we all kind of work together in our in our odd ways because the conversations are going to be ongoing. Um, and I, I'm so glad that you guys came to join me today and, and I'd love to have more questions, but I know we want to wrap you guys up. We've got a draw um, that we want to do. But again, thank you, Steve and Nicola and Tyler for coming out. Um, I'm sure that if there's a couple of questions you have at the end, they'd be more than happy to, to um, stay for a couple of minutes. Um, and there's coffee at the back still. We'll do a draw and uh, get you on your way. Thank you very much for taking this part in and thank you for being part of the panel, guys.